Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory. I'm your host, Pai. Now, our guest speaker for today is Yuta Ito, who is currently an assistant professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan. His research interest is in vision augmentation, which supports and enhances human vision via AR technology, including see-through near-eye displays. The title of his talk today is Vision Augmentation, How See-Through Displays Could Override Our Visual World Via Computation, which is about work on augmenting and enhancing our visual capabilities via AR technology. So the talk will be roughly an hour, and then later on, we'll have a brief Q&A session. Without further ado, over to you, um, Yuta. Thank you very much, Pai, and, and thank you for inviting this in wonderful opportunity to um, present my work. And so as Pai introduced, so my name is Yuta Ito from Tokyo Institute of Technology. And today in this one hour seminar, I will briefly talk about our research field about a vision augmentations. The title is like how C3 displays could override our visual world via computation. And for those who haven't maybe met before, and I just want to introduce me quick, quickly. So, so I'm basically working on augmented reality and especially in the subfield of AR. So like a display technology, like especially optical see-through head-mounted displays or near displays. And also jointly, I'm pretty much interested in how we can augment human skills and so on. So it's like a combination of this vision display and human augmentations. So yeah. If it were not for COVID-19, I would have really <laughs> tried to travel to every country. <laughs> so unfortunately, or well, fortunately, this is remote. So I just wanted to give you an idea of where I'm from. And so this is our campus. And then like, so like this, so quite, quite a bit, like lots of greens. Although it's a Tokyo Institute of Tech city, but actually our campus is a second campus. So it's been a bit away from the center of Tokyo. So if you... But it's a really nice place. If you have a chance in next years, I, may, I really recommend to visit our lab. And so the background, so as most of you, of course, know or working on this field, but AR is basically what, how we, is a technique, how we override the world with additional data, right? Like a typical example nowadays would be like, just say Pokemon Go, then your friends or any acquaintances would understand it. And then, IKEA also actually you, you had already this kind of smartphone apps on the, like 2013. I think it's also a video. It's like a, nowadays classic, but still it's a pretty nice uh, kind of demo video to get people idea about it. And then, so nowadays we have this commercially available near eye display, optical C3 near eye displays. So compared to the VR displays, which completely cover your face, and then you just see the virtual world, these OST HMDs allows you to see the real world without, like, as if just like normal eyeglasses. But then you can just overlay a ghosty, like this semi-transparent image. And with tracking sensing thing, then registering in 3D. So you can get the really feeling that this virtual object is existing in the real world, right? This, right? video. I just took with HoloLens one. And then, so then what we want to do is this, how we can enhance the technology and can assist the human vision is the main point of so this talk. And so the target of this talk or research field is that how we can use AR display to visual, to enhance our human vision skins. I mean, not just only showing the videos, but you can, so if you have like eye tracking cameras, et cetera, or sensing devices, the system or glasses can understand what you're seeing or the state of your current vision. Then depending on use cases, maybe the display can kind of override your scene in a way that it helps to your activities, et cetera. So it's kind of imagine like this feedback loop of like this eyes, uh, the system scanning eyes and then display something and then our vision maybe changes or our responses changes and then this, this just keeps going on. And in this kind of applications or vision augmentation applications, we can utilize those kind of C3 displays or spatial light modulated. So I will talk these kind of techniques later. And my brief overview of my kind of research world 
is divided into three pieces from like a base from fundamentals to more like kind of application field or low layer to the high layer is like so the number one the area one so i will first talk about this part is like ai display techniques because even you can buy those commercial displays but the images you get you probably know it's not perfect at all like some images are like the color is bad or the field is also limited and so on so there are tons of those fundamental research topics or problems issues in in the dis display technology itself and the second point is if we solve everything like get the ultimate see-through displays then we can think about maybe we can just then by after after that we can just freely kind of you know change any part of your field of view right and also users would not perceive it as as a virtual so it, because it's indistinguishable because the displays are so nicely designed and then what kind of kind of like vision augmentation applications we can try that that's the second point so and then the third point is kind of a bit uh, far off, but what happens in vision augmentation or any, any visual air applications like using displays? I mean, the real world actually doesn't change. Your, your, your cognition or the view that you are seeing will change, but physically it's not changing. And these days I'm, I'm just kind of interested in to explore what if we can also physically kind of or computational or physically change the world's response towards you if like like here in the picture like you throw a physical ball and then you see an AR avatar in the real world as if it's a real person like I don't know teleconferences via remote work and then the ball being thrown the physical one will be catched by this AR avatar that would be cool so I, I want to explore this kind of kind of uh, futuristics uh, technologies in in this third topic area all right. And yeah, I've been working several site, like research projects related to these three categories in my lab. And so in the from now on, I will just introduce many different like examples. So maybe it 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 will be looking looks like a like a bullet points talk or like a slides that you you have many different applications. But just ask me questions anytime if you had some some points that you want to ask during my talk, okay? Okay, the first part is the AI display technologies. And I think it has more, most, uh, many num I mean, so many number of uh, projects in, in this talk. So like realism, so AI display technique means for me, it's like how we can realize the AI as real as possible. And then of course, this is like a kind of core fundamental research question in the community. And then people have been exploring like a different topics like a spatial consistency. So the alignment of the virtual and the real world or temporal, like how you can minimize the rendering delay or latency between the, the real world and you know these all rendering processes like sensing and then computing the graphics and then show it as a photon and then, then derivers it to the eyes. That's the temporal consistency and bunch of perceptual consistencies like color, depths, occlusions, or accommodations, or versions, et cetera, or field of view. So all these kind of problems has to be solved if you want to have a real, I mean, working AI displays, right? And yeah, maybe I just skip these slides. I mean, we have now many different commercial applications and many of them have like pros and cons and you don't have any perfect ones, right? And so as you have seen, like spatial realism is kind of key, one of the most important key for AR experiences in both STH medias. Because I mean, if, if you have misalignment, you immediately see it, it's as a not like real. And these days actually like alignment is getting really better, especially like those commercial HMDs with tracking technique sensors like HoloLens, I think it's quite uh, consistent. But still, I mean, if you want to have a really perfect pixel matching reality, then you have to really know where your eye is locating because uh, if eye rotates or the if you touch the glasses, the, the alignment between the real world and the virtual world shown on, on the 2D virtual screen in front of you will be misaligned. 
So this has been an issue and a very early work of my research career. We, I, I just worked on this kind of like, a, you know, um, aligning everything automatically by tracking eye positions, etc. That was kind of a fun project. And then that one was kind of being enhanced by the following research that, that I worked with Alex in Otago U now, he's now, and that, that we measured, so tracking what's, what's reflected on the eyes because that's the, the direct information of this alignment, right? And then we basically captured what's shown on, what's, what's reflected on the eye surface cornea and then reconstructed the 3D position of the eye and then relationships. And then we were able to kind of compute the perspective matrix, projection matrix of this 3D rendering. And then I think two years ago, we also, cons and we also just worked hard on like how we can solve like uh, lens distortion or optics distortions because near eye displays are like eyeglasses and it has optics, right? Lenses and some, some magic mirrors or half mirrors to combine virtual images into the reality. And some displays, they have a kind of distortions and then the distortion pattern changes depending on where your eye is. So it's more, like, more or less like a camera calibration in computer vision where your sensor and your lens is not firmly fixed on your, your sensors, but the, the, the bodies, but the, the lens is just moving around. So, so whenever your eye is moving or rotating and we needed to compensate that and then estimate the distortion pattern of the display. And this is very complex nonlinear problem. So we just tried a, I mean, your network, it was a kind of, you know, hyped. So we just explored that kind of uh, new technique. <clears throat> and other example uh, problem is this optical occlusion, right? <clears throat> it's like a <clears throat> ghost, I mean, original like AR techniques like a Pepper's ghost. So they were always ghosty. And of course there are techniques like, I think most known one is Kiyoshi's work and that the occlusion capable displays where you basically insert a liquid crystal display, trans, transparent display, which can, you can just turn on black pixel and transparent pixel on and off. Then you can cut off a part of the real world light coming through, coming towards your eye, right? And then, but the, the, back then, I mean, the implementation was quite bulky. So we wanted to make it kind of simpler. And then one work was this one, like you just directly attach the occlusion mask in front of your glasses, which actually um, causes some blur because the mask is just too close to your eyes. And then the shadow created by the mask will be kind of breaching around the object. But uh, we, com we combined by showing the, okay, I, I just showed the video um, here. Doo, 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 doo. So, you know, this is what happens if you just render AL image on the display and then just the real world gets, I mean, uh, so the background is a real background taken by a see-through, taken by a user, point, user viewpoint camera and then image is just semi-transparent. And if you just show the mask, so imagine you have a shutter, I mean, you have a, just this liquid crystal displays in front of the c display. So you just display a mask image. You can kind of partially cut the light of the background, but the mask is too close to your eyes. Actually, that's why Kiyoshi's, the original work, he had to have the relay optics. It's a super bulky one. But the, if you just directly attach the LCD mask in front of your eyes, you can still, you, you can kind of cut, part of it, but it's not perfect because the shadow appears blurry. So because of your aperture, so it's like a defocused. And we know how much the LCD mask will be defocused on your eye. So we expanded the mask so that even if you defocus the, even if the mask is defocused, seen as defocused, you can still cover the entire image. But now the shadow is kind of bleaching. It's kind of funny impression, see, I mean, see visual, appearance that this shadow is kind of, you know, like absorbing the object some, somehow. And then we, what we did is then we actually rendered, oh, excuse me. We actually, oops, yeah, it's hard to control PowerPoints. Yeah, see, 
we actually just render the background real scene overlaid on the real on on the CISO displays. So you you just kind of visually enhance the shot the darker scene, which is basically kind of darkened by this half covered defocused LCD mask, so that you can oops, compensate that shadow mask. And we also did some color corrections of the background, the, the real camera, et cetera. Then, so this is a final result that the, you, you see as if the object is like really perfectly masked and shadow is not breaching. I mean, it's a really crystal clear occlusion is now realized. And so this is kind, kind of, you know, it's occlusion work. I mean, it's a like, optical see-through occlusion capable display technique, but then this kind of, you know, modifying the real world color will be actually then followed to our vision augmentation application we will talk that later but anyways so here then the next challenge we were thinking about okay so what about then the defocus i mean accommodations because any shadow i mean like you saw in the picture so that the mask was defocused because the, the position of the mask was not being focused by the eye and back then, I think we we now we were getting see through displays which can have a, like a very focal capability. That means, I mean, you can optically render an image in front of like close to your eyes or far from your eyes. So the image plane can can shift towards your depth direction, right? But then, if the optical virtual see through image moves along the, the view axis, I mean, the depth axis, <clears throat> then the shadow mask also, the occlusion mask also needs to be moved optically back and forth because object is here and the mask is rendered optically at this depth, then it doesn't match, right? It's like a, a kind of accommodation conflict. And then we wanted, we resolved that issue by kind of do, using some mechanical linear stage that can uh, move the LCD mask back and forth in a relay line system, which means actually, so if the LCD is at the center, which means that the shadow appears at the infinite distance. And then if the, the, the LCD, LCD panel shifts slightly towards your eyes is within this relay line system, the shadow appears, gets closer to your eyes. And this time, of course, we didn't uh, mind about the the size or bulkiness. I mean, so I we wouldn't call it near this place. It's just a bench top system. But then, so here the result we got was like this. So now you see the screw is rendered quite close to your eyes, and the background of the the just like a, a far far scene is completely blurred. And this camera we change the focus from far from. So now the camera is just focusing far distance. So you see the building there, maybe some, some hundreds meters away. And then the image is sharp and the mask is also appears sharp. And then now the camera just, oh, sorry. And then now the camera just focus a bit closer to the eyes. And then the, sharp, the mask also is reconfigured so that it appears sharp again and so on. Yeah, see. And then, yeah, so it's kind of interesting sensation that this, the mask is following your eye focus. Right. Maybe I just skip the detail because we don't, I think we will run out of time otherwise. So then, so I was just thinking, okay, hmm, just hiding, just cutting light from the background. Then, at one point, we just came to this idea that can we just create a see-through image by just utilizing the background white light, like stained glasses, right? If you go to churches, and then you you sometimes have this, you know, colorful like artworks that made out of those stained glasses, and then if the sunlight shines, and then you have a vivid color on on the window, right? And that kind of like images so we we got this idea because another problem of mi display is that if you go outside because of the sunlight you can't really see it right like it's pretty much like you have a smartphone and you just go outside and then you don't see it 
And that's that's why we created a kind of we we thought about this idea. Hmm. Instead of just adding light like near eye displays in the light left hand side, can we create a light by color images by subtracting lights? And these are kind of complementary because uh, subtraction means like you can't see any images when the scene is dark, whereas the near eye displays you can see image clearly if the room is completely dark and so on. So it's quite complementary, and. So we use the technique, uh, physical phenomena cause like uh, cause polarized interference colors, which means if you if the, your light source is polarized, so and then you have kind of transparent plastic or polymer thing in between, and then the light can it interfere each other in different wavelengths and so on, and then you actually observe this kind of color. You probably have seen this kind of like a rainbowish image on a, like a like this kind of system, or if you have a like an oil on the water surface, and then you see this like you know rainbowish color. It's because of this effect. And then luckily we had a device uh, which a liquid crystal display devices which can control this kind of polarization, pixel by pixel. So I mean, liquid crystal display essentially it's a physical device. Each pixel can manipulate the state of light in terms of polarization. And then, so we just kind of created a benchtop device which works as as if like this previous like uh, image uh, the video that each pixel actually can show different colors by subtracting by works as a color filter. On the bottom, this color chart it's it's actual just example what happens if you set the this the LCD color LCD intensity like a, a eight bit input from zero to two hundred fifty five. And then you have this polarization light system, and then you see each pixel creates different color, right? And then, as as I said, so like if we want to see bright image when the scene is completely bright, so we had the like strong photo studio light in the background, and on top of the studio light, of course, ordinarily displays you can't see anything because it's completely overexposed. I mean, brass up, uh, but our system can render vivid image. And here is the video of the system actually working, although we didn't turn on the light. But you see on the white background, you see this kind of, oh, it's a bit defocused. Here we go, like this image shown on the, on the background. And nothing, no lights, no, no power needed. I mean, no light power is needed. You don't need any light sources. You just need a background. Then you can see an image. And then last year we kind of enhanced the system because the color of the previous video was kind of not perfect or good. So it used to, we used to have that kind of before image. And then we kind of improved the system by doing some other extra hardware technique. And then we, and we were able to get the as, as good as this quality in our current system. So, Basically, if you have a, have a white background and then you can get this kind of like a realistic colors. And the interesting thing is because it's a color filter, it's not like RGB LEDs. So which has only like a red and green and blue channel. Each color shown here, you, you have a kind of true color because each color corresponds to one. I mean, it's like really like on the wavelengths, it's like one peak or kind of several peaks. So each color is working as a, like a hyper hyper spectral colors, right? So that's an interesting part. And sometimes we also worked on, hey, can we then enhance the brightness of the near eye displays? So we did a trick or we cheated a bit that we combined the projectors so that we can enhance or like a cast uh, the way higher brightness in if you wear HMD I and mean, you can't do it with just single OST HMDs. So basically the user wearing an HMD being tracked, then they can see like this kind of specular part. It's quite bright, shiny area, which is helped by a projector. Right, so like color and depth. So I still have like 30 minutes. I 
before going to the second section, maybe I quick I also introduce one more interesting research. It's more like a perception side research that I I uh, collaborated with uh, Echo Central Nance Group. They were, so they're one of their student, Etienne Paylor, he was visiting our lab. So we are lucky they had a chance to physically collaborate each other in, in, the, in Japan. And then back then, so we had a, this kind of retinal scanning CISO displays. Maybe you haven't heard of it. It's a cool, really cool CISO display technique that you use, you shoot laser into your eyes directly. <laughs> Sounds a bit scary, right? Uh, but of course, that the, the power is is just carefully chosen so that it doesn't hurt or burn your retina. But com so basically, the idea is simple, like this left figure. So you have a laser source, and the laser source is like pretty much like a pico projector. That that this MEMS mirror is scanning, and then it's reflected back on this curved half mirror. And then basically each light, each laser's rays just directly go through the eye lenses and then scan on the, on the screen, which means retina. And then you can perceive an image. And the good point is this kind of display is focus-free. Even if you're nearsighted, myopia, or farsighted, you don't need to wear eyeglasses to see sharp image. I mean, like, you know, it's typical issue. Like, hey, I just wear a headset and you can't see anything without wearing eyeglasses, but your eyeglasses can't fit. It doesn't happen on this display because you, the lasers just directly go through the eye lenses and it ignores the, the diopter of this, I mean, this optical effect. Of course, it slightly shrinks or, or expands the size of the image, but essentially it does not cause any blur, blur because it's laser. Each pixel is just one single layer of light. So the lens distortion doesn't blur it. So then we had a question, hmm, you know, this famous accommodation versions conflict that your eye accommodation and that this sterile image capability, uh, sterile image that the brain perceives uh, kind of inconsistent and people get like a VR sickness address. And what if the image is always in focus and we still have a stereo cube? Can, is the depth perception, does the depth perception changes, change? And that was our question. And we built the careful like experiment subjective study setup. And the result was this. Uh, OST HMS, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's OST HMD. So from, from researchers, we already knew that OST HMDs with single focal plan with sterile images, they bias human depth perception. People always kind of misjudge depths a bit far from the reality. So the, imagine that the, the red curve is the real depth responses, uh, I mean, real objects, and the blue line or green line are the sub subjects res average of the subject's response for given depth target image. So the, the study was, the test was like user was asked to point the position without seeing the hands that, that where the current image is shown, uh, current real object is locating. And then, in a stereo retina projection, this known bias kind of significantly reduced, if not completely matching. And that was quite interesting observation. And then, uh, so we were thinking, so we, we said like, okay, maybe this mis mis misleading cues are now gone and the focus is always focused. So the brain is just purely judging by just measuring the versions, et cetera, right? All right, so the second topic, as I said, the first part is the longest part. So the, the last two parts are kind of concise, but the now second part is about vision augmentations. So as I've been saying like several times, so it's like a, you, you just imagine the feedback between the scene camera, eye camera displays, and then they, they measure something and they show something to the eye and they measure the eyes and so on. And one application you remember in occlusion paper, we were kind of augmenting the background scene by just overlaying the same image to compensate the image intensity changes. Here we, so I, so I worked with Tobias Langos and from Otago, Otago, that if the display can directly change the color or brightness of the scene that user is actually looking, maybe we can help people. 
And then this time, so what we did was for, for those who have color deficiencies. So colorblind people sometimes like depending on the type of color blindness, people cannot, cannot distinguish green and red easily. And for that cases, what we did is this, this optically aligned scene cameras captured exactly the same scene as the user would have seen, would seen, would be seeing, and then augment some colors by just showing some subtle color supporting images. And then people, it's slight changes, but I mean, if, if there are those who have color blindness, they might not be able to recognize this number, read numbers as 74, but instead 71. But by augmenting some colors there, and it's getting much easier for them to, uh, to perceive it or recognize it. And here is the, again, the benchtop demo that we built. Again, so eye position is important to get the perfect alignment, see? But again, <laughs> if everything is perfectly calibrated, this is what we would see, that these numbers are nicely, this red area is nicely augmented. And it's not only just changing color, maybe we can enhance edges and so on. So we try the different types of kind of visualization techniques so that those colorblind subjects can, uh, to check if they can really see the difference or not. And also important thing is this time we manually allow, uh, allow the subjects to manually adjust the color filter parameters. Because even if you have a kind of color blindness, the pattern is different. And the ideal case, of course, using your eye camera and then eye camera analyzes your eye and then see, okay, I, we measured your fungus, the retina. So the color RGB pixel ratio is blah, blah, blah. So we adjusted the parameter, but of course we didn't have that technique yet. But assuming that everything is done, so this time we let the users manually change something, then, then this efficiency of this kind of optimization got improved. So that's, that's the, basically the concept of vision augmentation. I mean, if we, our system can perfectly display something and know everything about the eye, so what we could do. And for this experiment, we just uh, rely on this from manual input, but uh, that was kind of interesting concept, proof of concept system. And other vision augmentation application we also tested was like a smart sunglasses. You know, um, if you just go out from dark room to outside, maybe um, you, you then get kind of a little bit blinded because the su sudden brightness changes takes, takes your eyes to get used to it. And we kind of said, okay, if we combine these LCD masks we've been using always for occlusion, maybe we could adaptively kind of not only just hide the background as a shadow mask, but also just kind of attenuate the background light so that people can get more comfortable kind of visual uh, light changes. Or if you use HMDs, you can actually augment the color, right? And in the, in the previous occlusion display paper, we, we had to kind of enhance the color of darker background region, right? So we combined these ideas and then made this smart glasses adaptive visor, which makes brighter region darker and also over underexposed region brighter by showing uh, the shadow mask for the brighter region and, and adding more colors on the darker region by using like cameras which can which can be you know tuned to can capture both bright and darker region and okay here i think the visual result will be more convincing um, in the in the left image so it's just just a raw vision so we did nothing for the system with the system but the right system so now it has a, this shadow mask technique and also c3 display area so you can control the brightness of the scene. So see, it's subtle change, but you, you realize that this part, the left side of this uh, food replica was too bright and couldn't see it. But now you can see the detail of the object because we are properly decreasing the brightness of the scene. Whereas the shadow, the real shadow area here at the center of the picture is too dark, but the camera could see because you can you know, tune the camera to capture a brighter image. 
So we then took that same image and then overlay it on the CISO display, right? Although this time the, the sharpness of the image was not perfect, but still, I mean, we could, we were able to kind of show the concept like this. Was an interesting project too. Right. And, oops. And recently we also tried another thing with a similar optical setup that like, uh, um, especially, so, you know, dehazing technique in computer vision. So like sometimes the scene, especially like if you go to mountains and you just see the scenery and then like towns kilometers away looks slightly kind of blur, slightly kind of less contrast, like white, white out because of the atmosphere, like scattering light from the scene. And then there is a technique called dehazing which is basically remove this kind of like haze, hazy view by just sharp, by just improving the brightness of the captured area. And then we, we just, oh, sorry, v, not V haze, it's a D haze glasses. But anyways, um, yeah, D haze here. So the, so haze removal. And we, what we did is this, we utilize this again, this kind of occl occlusion capable displays and then apply those kind of dehazing a com, uh, image processing technique in the real physical optical light in the background. And the change on probably on Zoom or on your monitor, does this, the change is quite subtle, but actually it's, it's, it, there is a difference that they're making the scene kind of sharper and then clearer, right? And so these are all like about colors or like brightness of the scene. And we also wanted to kind of explore if we can like enhance the human accommodations or like uh, some nearsighted eyes or farsighted eyes, like the chroma glasses we showed that for the color blindness people, we once had a like edge enhancement, right? And edge enhancement means like it reconstructs the detail of the scene. And if you kind of augment the scene in a proper way, with the camera, which is focusing at the object, and then maybe a camera, which has a better eyesight than your eyes, and then augment the image, you could kind of slight, you could sharpen your eyes. That was one research work we were doing. And, but this is still like kind of optical or, or like image or display kind of solution that you have to display image directly. And then that's why we actually tried uh, a programmable glasses. Okay, let me show you one. Okay, maybe I just start with this, right? So we, we again use the different types of liquid crystal displays, which can be used as a lens, programmable lens. So here, our system, you can see, you see the lens pattern. Can, can you see this slight like a gradation of lens pattern, right? It's displayed as an 8-bit input on this special display. And this special light moderator, you can actually drive it as a kind of thin lens. You might have seen this kind of like a plastic card like magnifiers, which has this kind of like a concentric circle pattern, which is actually, it's called Fresnel, Fresnel lens and it works as a convex lens. And the good thing is, if what, so it's like a second monitor. You just render this monochrome, monochrome gradation pattern and depending on the pattern, it works as a different, like a focal length lens as shown on this quick video. And then, so we did some yeah, testing, like so you use air marker and then the smart programmable lens tries to just change the focal length of the lens, eye lens, uh, I mean, the the lens and then it's just keep focusing on one object or you render two lenses uh, simultaneously because it's programmable and then you can focus two objects simultaneously see the near and the far are kind of focused simultaneously and even more kind of extreme application would be like you can also turn the scene by rendering this kind of striping so it's like a tilted glasses and it can slightly shift your view X and Y directions. And then you can stabilize the view like on the right video. 
So even even if the scene is kind of saturating, I mean, like moving side by side, and then you can still kind of see the marker center, even if uh, the same motion. Because the system is viewing the scene and just programmably, uh, just programming the lens in a way to cancel it out. All right. Um, yeah, we also once worked with Jason Oloski from Osaka U using eye tracking or this kind of all this eye measurement system to help diagnosing some neurodegenerating diseases in a VR headset. So I, I help the eye tracking part. All right. So the last part of the talk, and also I only have 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, maybe I exceed a bit. But so the final thing is, okay, we've been showing, okay, how we make the AL visuals as real as possible. And also the augmenting with this kind of ultimate displays, maybe we can seek for potential applications of augmenting vision for the sake of improving human perception or helps helps them or assist them for some tasks, right? And then we come to the point, okay, even if we change the visual of the world, we also want the world also being changed accordingly what they are seeing. I mean, sounds like it's a bit uh, kind of contradicting, but for example, we once worked on this kind of like a, another, actually it's a vision augmentation work, I would say. It's a Laplacian vision we call. It's more like a, that people being able to pre, 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 I mean, uh, uh, predict the world. So it's like a make people pre -cold. So like a superhuman <laughs> vision system. So where, so basically the sensing system in the scene uh, tracks a real world object. And then the system predict its trajectories and then render it in a see-through manner, real time on the on the CISO display. And the demo video will be easier to get the idea. So here was the, like a, a demo at the ETEC SIGRA that we demonstrated this. Yeah, I still remember this, like we were slowing balls in front of visitors all day, <laughs> five, five or four days long. <laughs> if you have done real, I mean like these public demos, it's really kind of hard fun. But any, anyway, so, so we had this kind of system and we consider this as a technique that add humans to kind of predict the real world scale, right? But again, still it's nothing to do with the real world. I mean, it doesn't change anything going on in the world. And that's why we explored recently a computational ultrasound force field technique. So I collaborated with people from U Tokyo, University of Tokyo, and they were an expert in controlling this kind of, you see this black tile wall, the nine, nine tiles, they consist of hundreds of ultrasound speakers, powerful speakers. And what happens is if you control each speaker and, of the, and also the phase of the speaker, so it means like a delay of the sound, uh, how to say, the timing of the sinusoidal pattern in, in delta T-wise, you can actuate, actually create a false uh, ultrasound field. All these ultrasound speaker focus, focus at one point in space. And, you know, ultrasound speaker, I mean, sound vibrates the air, which is a physical force. So if you control those speakers in a smart way, then focus at one single point of all those hundreds of speakers, then the point gives certain, some tens of milligrams force in real time, in real space. And so they were an expert in this field. And then, hey, if we have our, like this tracking concept, can we actually physically interact with balls in real time? And then we chose a ping pong because it's a light object. And then here, I think this is a video from them. Yeah, I just borrowed. And then here, see, and now the ball is just curved, even though you just hit the ball. I mean, you just throw a ball straight. Again, the system's on, so see. And because what we did is like this, yeah, with just some speaker. So you see, this is the amount of the force they can create. And yeah, and then basically they made a superhuman 
sport, ping pong game, that the people can, con people just have a switch. And then whenever they want to do some miracle shot, you just press the button and then you can yeah. kind of physically um, change the trajectory of ball. And this is very interesting work, I think, because now computation can change the, the, the way that the real world behaves. And if you imagine we combine our previous AR display technique, so you can really just change the trajectory as we want. Like you, your AR display shows some, some lines and then maybe the physical object will be following because of this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then let me show some more kind of physical AR interaction research project we've been doing. So this one is not the real physical interaction, but we were thinking, hey, drones are a bit scary. Maybe they, Amazon drones, maybe, you know, flying around. <laughs> The world in in the in the near future, or like auto, automated cars, they are driving near everywhere <clears throat> in your town. And then once we get that kind of like a remote autonomous robot systems or or, or moving systems, are like a normal technique, and then maybe people bit feel might feel a bit uncomfortable, or they want to like they do not want to see this kind of robots just moving around your wall because I mean, it, sometimes maybe it's a bit annoying. And then we were th thinking, hey, can AR or like visually augmenting or hide those objects can help people to change the way they feel those kind of objects. And then what we did was this drone camera technique. So we wanted to just kind of modulate the comfort level of people against this kind of autonomous robots. And then, so here, and it worked, of course. I mean, when you show this kind of nice unicorn character, although the sound is annoying, uh, their acceptance level has been kind of improved. Whereas, yeah, so the B <laughs> or hornet, yeah, it's a hornet. I think the sound matches, isn't it? <laughs> the sound and the visual effect was really, 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 really changes the way you see this drone. I mean, even if as as I mean, even if for us who implemented system, we wear it and try it in the real, I mean, with the real system, it really kind of felt a bit scary. I mean, maybe from the video, you don't feel this, but wearing HMD and seeing it is completely different experience. And that was a very interesting uh, project. And, and then the last work uh, I, want to I want to present in this talk is this. So maybe I showed you a little bit about this kind of like a paradigm or a concept that Maybe we can think about the level of interaction of this kind of like a material AR interactions. So like the complete virtual one is of course the VR. So no virtual, only just virtual object. You throw the ball, the ball just goes through that object, right? So that's kind of reality level zero. And like that ways, and maybe you add more actuators and then you throw a real object. Oh, sorry, the real zero is you throw a virtual ball in the VR space. You, so you just you know, throw a ball, you do this motion and your visual scene, you see a virtual ball just flying somewhere, right? Or you can physically throw a ball and then may an avatar can catch it or a human just assist it. And then the ultimate like reality level would be just you throw the real ball and the real person take it, right? So there is like, like this Milgram's continuum. So like, I think material and AR interaction also have this kind of like a kind of spectrum. And then we, were, we are currently exploring that doing some user studies. And hopefully potentially we install this kind of robot arm in the future and maybe this diminish it and then we completely just implement AR system that can physically catch the ball. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up my talk. Uh, oops, I think I forgot to change. Oh yeah, here is the English version of it. So the future prospects, yeah. So what shall we do in the future for the future? I mean, like we've been doing these AR things and now all this COVID mess came or COVID-019. Sounds, sounds more scary than just 19. 
um, let's say so now I think the society has been cha has changed and I think many other speakers might have also noted this point that our like you know the, the world is kind of getting used to this situation but it's I think the way we live in the near future would definitely be, be different from our our past life right and I'm just working on AR and also human augmentation. And from that point of view, I was just thinking, hmm, what kind, what kind of like uh, help? I'm mean, how my my expertise can help these kind of situations. And then this is more like a blueprint, or just I'm just talking about my just thought. But this technique, if you think about from this kind of aspect, it's how other people recognize. You. I mean, it can change how other people recognize you, right? Especially like a VR. I don't know outside of Japan, but now in Japan, I think virtual avatar is quite hot, especially for those like uh, like manga, anime communities. And there are like a virtual v virtual YouTubers we call VTubers, like using just Oculus or and it use those kawaii characters, anime character like thing. Maybe inside then it's just like like some some male adults inside <laughs> that's often the case but there are many those kind of like virtual avatars which basically change the way people see you and you don't need to feel like about uh, your appearance right you don't need to care how people i mean you can easily change your appearance so maybe the physical yourself maybe it's it's less important than before because you can easily disguise how you've been looking, right? That's one aspect of this kind of VR AR technique. And you can also change how you see the wall using those vision augmentation techniques, right? Maybe change the color, just change the color, or maybe you diminish something you don't want to see it. But there are like these two directions. That's that's my what I see on these kind of techniques. Or if you physically augment, I mean, human augmentation skill, you can advance your skills so that you can do something that you would have not been able to do without such techniques, right? And one important thing is we cannot change how other people see you. I mean, we technically we can, but I think ethically we shouldn't do too much about that. I think that's also an interesting research question, but uh, it is, I, I just want to say it is easier to change with these techniques that how you see the world, because that's the parameter you can control. and and you can't control, even if you should use nice avatar, maybe people think, ha, huh, I don't like that avatar. See, this is something you can't control. And that might be, that, that's why I think it's interesting to kind of focus on, especially from air perspective, we just kind of enrich technology that can change the, this kind of, I mean, explore how we, how, what kind of this kind of, you know, changing technique, like how you see the world would help. And it might be leading to more comfortable life for yourself. Um, I just give you more, I, I mean, like examples uh, uh, can be considered as this kind of technique. For example, diminished reality is one thing because it's just, it's exactly like this. I mean, you can just hide advertisement you don't want to see or some object that you don't like in the world. And also you can use, I don't know, like a glasses that can remember people's name and face. And this is also like maybe ease in your life. And oh yeah, there was also interesting taste research. Like in AR, augmenting taste is pretty pretty difficult. I mean, super difficult, but like there are people like using some electrodes and then like uh, like enhance the way you, per, you taste things and so on. Or you feel like you are a super professional pianist just wearing this kind of uh, air actuated gears and then you can your hands play piano and you feel kind of happy with that right and one research i just found interesting i just found while thinking about this kind of thinking is that this uh, vr chat vr technique which you can kind of uh, simulate how for example different people see the world like uh, you you have the, for example this particular system you let people wear a headset and then they they get the video see through vision of the kids so you can kind of experience the way kids are seeing the world so like it would be useful to design like hey maybe this kitchen is too small too low for too high for kids or it's not universal and so on but 
like just experiencing others, how others see the world. So I, I was talking about just change how you see the world, but you can also kind of utilize that kind of techniques to just virtually experience how people think, feel the world. And that might be also something helping your way see the world. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let me wrap up. So my research project, therefore, um, I will keep continuing on explore technology to transform this kind of like a reality and also potentially kind of, and kind of try to find out how to breach this kind of AI world with the, this material world by using computations. Yeah, and therefore, yeah, so display technology is quite difficult still it's not perfect yet but i think one key research area i feel is like holography because the holography is the only way or is one of the true ways to recreate the real world light field and i think it has a huge potential and people like if you see graphics communities there have been many holographic AI displays in these years and i think it will be a trend in, in the near future right all right, so let me summarize my talk. So towards vision augmentation. And so you need, I think two things that, that you have to augment image successfully in your vision perfectly, indistinguishably. And then we need also need to control the light coming from the real world to modulate the human vision. And why we do this? Because it has lots of lots of potential application that help our, our like life and then techniques and then and it's quite a fun area. It's like a mixture of like a physical and then image and light. This is very um, much like a diverse area. You need lots of help from different people. And so therefore I also want to thank for all collaborators though in, in domestic and international collaborators have been working and also students in my lab. Yeah, thank you for listening. That's it. Thank you very much for the presentation, Yuta. We are now open to questions. So if there are any, please just raise your hands on the um, participant list and I'll call you out. Otherwise, you could just type it down on the um, chat and I'll also read out the questions. So does, does anyone, I see a lot of virtual claps, but is there anyone raising <laughs> their hands for, for a question? Otherwise, maybe I'll start with the first question first. Um, so you presented sure. a lot of projects and that's really amazing. So I suppose I'll just try to ask some of these projects a little bit more detail. Um, one of the earlier ones sure. you showed was about the occlusion cable of HMD, where you just you showed about rendering the teapot and how to make it look more clear um, without the see-through of the right. teapot. Yeah, something like this. And you said that one of the solutions that you used was to render the background um, behind it as well so it looks more clear. Um, so I, I understand that if you're going to test this, is probably you probably had the camera on a static position, like fixed so that the background will not have any tracking <laughs> issues. So did, did right. you manage to test this on like a mobile HMD or a mobile camera or mounted on the head? Or is that like a key limitation that you're still working on? Or is that been solved? Any anything you could share with that? Right, right. I think that's a great point. Uh, you might have been our reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you need exact the same scene camera is the key for for this kind of technique because if the image you captured the world is slightly distorted, and then you have to compensate it. Technically, you can you can undistort the image in a way that the image captured at a different position will be looking similar to the eye position. So see here is the scene camera, and you have a half mirror here, and the HMD is actually behind this LCD, and another eye po another user perspective camera is behind it. So that means actually this camera is positioned optically at the symmetric position of the eye position. Yeah, therefore they, th th that's, that's why we need this nice alignment. Mm -hmm. Great, um, thanks for that. Uh, is, there, is there any more questions from, oh, okay, we have one from Suranga. Hi, uh, great presentation. I have a, a question related to your slide 71. You showed several uh, potential application scenarios that are foreseeable in the near future. I was curious 
whether you had some underlying principles when you were thinking about potential applications of some of your technologies. Could you talk about the, the underlying principles when you think of uh, the usage of, of uh, you know, your technologies or what drives you to, to develop these certain techniques? Right, right. Um, so basically, I understood the question as how we get the ideas of this kind of applications on vision, vision augmentation applications. By the way, so on these slides, most uh, all the works are all these like not our groups, but just I took all from other people's group to inspire, ex, ex, to inflate our thoughts and ideas. But for the previous applications that we've been showing in our talk, um, so on the vision augmentation applications. So we are basically thinking about the limit. So we usually have this thinking, we, we, our way of thinking is this way. Um, yeah, I mean, like human beings has limitations, right? And, and then there are some like, and then we start with these limitations and then thinking about, usually think about then what capability would help or for example, this color deficiency, it, it was kind of clear example that they need help and it's it's caused by this human capabilities limitation that they cannot see the color and then we just hit that point or the dehaze one was like we had a once like hazy day and then hey we wanted maybe it's it would be nice if we can get the image the scene sharper maybe if you climb mountains and then you have a clear vision that would be nice so it's sometimes spontaneous, sometimes focused, but I think that's the way research will be going. I hope this is answering to your question. Okay, so uh, yeah, just a, just a quick follow-up. So sure. I, I, I get the point, uh, basically the, the requirement come from that particular scenario, that's, that's great. I was also curious if you, if you impose in your vision of augmented vision, do you impose other constraints when you think of a solution, right? Now, the problem is clear. When you think of a solution, do you impose constraints as part of your, your vision on, on augmented vision? Like, constraints. The, uh, just to clarify, so is it about just solving the problem somehow or you have specific considerations because of the, 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 the way you think of how the the augmented vision should look like. Oh, uh, that's that's very good question. I actually, to be honest, I haven't thought about that much. <laughs> Sometimes we have these in interesting use cases, and I mean, I think constraints would be like if it's uh, maybe maybe this thing. Um, Sometimes this display technology, I mean, like implementations has to be realistic. That's sometimes we con do consider. Although we always say, okay, display technique, I mean, we always have like this kind of benchtop systems that's totally not wearable. But like these cases, we did consider how could we, <clears throat> could we really realize it, miniaturize it as, as it is usable for users. Yeah, but often that, thinking fails because we can't really implement small system. Thank you so much. Great. Um, do we have any more questions from anyone? Yes, we have one from Moritz. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Yuta, hi, for this awesome talk. Very interesting. Um, sounds really interesting, new techniques you propose. I can't wait for, for it getting deployed so I can <laughs> for human skills or apply some filter which makes my world just look more nicer to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was curious, um, you talked about a lot of techniques and I was wondering whether you asked yourself the question whether if applied in real worlds um, you would always want to um, have this feature turned on like mm. For example, helping, yeah, switching between the augmented and the real view. And I was wondering, I mean, maybe there's already a, a work existing on this, um, whether you thought about techniques to transition from one to the other, um, which, which, which helps the user to, to switch between these 
states, I would say, the, the augmented world and the other, mm -hmm. or whether there are clever ways of transition between them. Yeah, Molit, I, I love the question. <laughs> I think we should work together on that topic even. Um, it's it's really interesting question because how we turn on this feature for particular use cases, right? And it's definitely like the system needs to understand the context. And I think that's the less explored feel. Like if you have this kind of smart AI devices and then when we just turn it on, I mean, does user always needs to just, you know, oh, okay, I now want to have this feature like a smartphone app, you just start. Maybe it works, it works, but it wouldn't be as easy as just you just tap on the smartphone. So that might be very interesting, like seeing camera, just smartly recognize the current situation. Okay, you maybe now need the dehaze because the scene is a bit blurry or, okay, now you are, I mean, basically augmenting the, the vision might not be comfortable because you, at least you degrade the real view. And for example, like the colorblind cases, maybe the person can just live without a problem for most of the situations, but at some particular point, okay, now you are reading some colorful textbook. You, you need this feature. Okay, I turn on. That would be really wonderful. And then uh, and definitely should be, uh, is a wonderful potential research area we should explore. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very interesting. I was thinking of some action the user can do to trigger it. Um, yeah, I like that to also think of some agent which recognizes the context and and mm. um, 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 switches on or transitions between these views on on demand. Yeah, very interesting. Right, right, right. Yeah, thanks for asking the question. Hmm. Great. Um, can we have more questions from anyone? Maybe I'll follow up with the question as well. Um, so I'll think a little bit more about this application side as well. So I really like the direction of the third one, which is the reality consistency. When you first spoke about it, I thought about a demo that I saw in Secret of Asia 2019, I think. Um, and in that demo, they showed, it's a very simple mm. but interactive demo where the user wears a HoloLens. I think they just do like some, some sort of like a shooting gesture. And then when they try to shoot, they see like a hmm. virtual laser. And when the laser hits something in the, in the real world, there's actually, there are actually motors, uh, actuators um, <laughs> attached to many things around the world. And when you shoot it, then you will react to it. Like the, like a teddy bear will fall down or right. like, you know, it will hit the gong and then you can hear the gong sound and everything. So it's all synchronized with the vision and the motor. So I was kind of thinking about that too. So in my opinion, your the, your reality consistency direction is actually very much haptics. I think it's very much haptics in, in my opinion. And you showed uh, right. as well the, the the example of using the ultrasound haptics, which which I believe yeah, you could actually just, you could buy a simpler version of that. Like I think like with the ultra leap or something. Um, so from what I've seen from the demo that I've tried as well as the videos that you've showed, a lot of them it's that it's fun. It's really cool to manipulate <laughs> ping pong. But do you think there's anything else that's more practical in terms of applications for, for something like this that you could share with us? Right, right. Wow, wow. That, you, love, you love tough questions. Um, <laughs> that's what I do. I mean, the, of course. Yeah, uh, the, the ultimate goal I was thinking when I was thinking about this material consist physical consistency was exactly like the holodeck, right? I mean, or like the, the uh, Ivan Sutherland's ultimate displays, if you got shot by a virtual bullet, you die. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. that's too extreme, but that kind of like physical interaction will be, I think, the final goal. For, mm -hmm. use, for, for existing application, you ask me, um, I think like touching and the user physically get this kind of haptics feedback is one point. But I was also more interested in if the kind of this kind of indirect physical interaction, like thinking think about the throwing ball. At at the time the avatar catches, you don't haptically get any feedback. You just see visually it's consistent. So you can trick the person without using this kind of haptics. I mean, we have different directions, and but I, I'm just interested in that kind of like you know easier setup can first help. Then maybe we should also move on to this kind of tactile feedback. Maybe maybe it just sound. Who right. knows? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, any more questions from anyone? Otherwise, I'll just keep raining in difficult questions for you to answer. Yeah, I love I love that. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, um, great. So we have a question from Tam, actually. He says he's wondering if you would like to catch up sometimes next week and discuss potential collaboration on some topics. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? I mean, now, as I said, so deadline seasons are now going... I, I'm, I'm, I'm passing through that season now. So <laughs> I'm happy to have a really good correlations or discussions. What kind, of, what kind of work are you doing right now? If, I mean, we still have some time. Tom, if, if you can if you can speak now otherwise we can also just discuss offline don't worry it's a like a remote this is a virtue of remote talks mm -hmm. some of these people can't speak but still listen all right so yeah. uh, thanks for the talk um i hope my daughter is not going to cry right now um, <laughs> because See? i'm working from home today um that's why i kind of um, don't want to use audio but um for 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 us um right now i am focusing on uh, I think three areas that I try to um, make it take off. One is like human AI collaboration. Uh, second one is around passive uh, haptic. And the third mm. one is around gaming um, because kind of we teach game here. So I have to apply it in, in games and probably looking at kind of um, either interaction over our experience and kind of uh, intelligence. Uh, in games, this kind of thing. But um, from your project, past project, I'm interested in the virtual physical uh, interaction uh, mm. part. Um, the other part, definitely interesting as well, but uh, I don't think I can get into those areas because of the high cost of an entry due to equipment and you know, <laughs> <laughs> those, those um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess. Uh, I am right now uh, collaborating with uh, Plinya as well, Plinya from Osaka. And oh, yeah, Parinya, yeah. Yeah, yeah we are working yeah. in kind of virtual lab stuff uh, at the moment. Right. Yeah, right. but yeah, definitely uh, would like to discuss with you more yeah, on let's, physical let's, virtual interaction. Let's, let's do that. I mean, Daisuke, yeah. I mean, in Parinya and his lab, Daisuke's lab, I, I, I have a very close correlation now, and yeah. we are even having the same funding together. Yeah. Well, so project, I guess, so yeah, I think we can then, yeah, maybe merge certain topic and interest together and then, yeah, pursue some higher impact, I think, um, outcome, contribution. That would be great. Yeah. Yep. Looking forward to it. Let's talk that offline. Yep. All right. It would be great if you can send a message after this talk. Yep. All right. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Sure, always happy to bring people together. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a question from Rio. Uh, is there? Oh, okay. Oh, Hello. He's raising can, hands. can you hear me? Yes. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk, Ito Sensei. Um, it was very fun to see all your, your projects. Um, I'm especially interested, particularly interested in the, the flat. Um, liquid crystal based lens system oh, you use yeah. for your project. Yes. And then I'm just wondering if you, if I'm just wondering if it's possible to use that for other um, systems <laughs> to distort the signal, like for example, the ultrasonic sound or like radio signal using the same lens. Do you have any mm -hmm. idea? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, sound waves or sound waves might be okay. So you ask me if sound waves or radio waves can be also used for with this kind of liquid crystal displays. Um, yes yeah, and no. So, so uh, I, oh, sorry. Please. So I, I, I guess this thing works as a kind of Fresno lens, and then um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to use right. uh, uh, adapt this uh, to other system rather than right. like optical. Um, right, measure it. right. System. Actually, that's really a, f a nice fundamental question because it's actually this kind of spatial light moderators, liquid crystal light, spatial light moderators. People in physics being or astronomy being using it to for physicists, they use always with lasers to just change the beam or wave of the beam, and for astronomy, they actually use like compensating atmosphere distortion coming the starlight coming from the sky get aberrated by the atmosphere randomly and then they use this kind of device to correct it and for the sound waves i mean as you see 
it's always come with light. So it's a liquid crystal that delays the light. So phase or polarization. Uh, actually, essentially, this is a device. You change the timing of light going through. So it only unfortunately works with light, but of different wavelengths. I mean, if the wavelength changes, the way that this liquid crystal can delay the light changes, of course, of the going because of the wavelengths. And ultrasound is actually vibration of the air. So you cannot directly use this kind of device. But if you look at the literatures, they have 3D printed perennial patterns physically, and then use that as, as a kind of, you know, this kind of like a special special sound modulator. Because the, the good thing of sound wave is it's a vibration of air. So you just need a micro physical structure, not like this liquid crystal phase structure. Just you need a physical structure. And also the sound waves is, wavelength is way bigger than light. So you can actually 3D print those kind of micro structure by good 3D printers. And then you can modulate the sound to like focus on one point and so on. You should definitely just search for it. It's it's quite a fun area. I love I love that field too. Sub field too. Hmm. Cool, interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, maybe one last question. Anybody has one last question for Utah before we wrap things up? Maybe I will. If if that's the case, I will present the last question. Um, so I really like the the work you shared by Etn regarding the retinal projection. Um, because you know when you mentioned about wearing glasses in HMD, that's very relatable to me as well. You know, before I buy a VR display, I need to make sure that my glasses fit into it. <laughs> um, so I like it that you know using something like this, you don't have to care too much about how bad my eyesight is. Um, so, well, I have two questions actually. So, why, why, what do you think is the main uh, reason why this is not too mainstream yet for consumer displays? Is it too expensive? Is it not? exactly safe enough for consumers or is it too much energy? It's my first question. And secondly, you had an interesting um, plot, I think, I think it was 45, yeah, the next slide um, in your plot 45, in your slide 45, where you showed that the perceived distance and the actual distance is very much closer um, using in the, in the right plot, in the right plot. And what I find interesting is that there's an overlap between the two, two lines as though there's a prime distance like in the in the x-axis is real position so maybe that's i don't know 450 meters or something there seems to be a point where there's an overlap with the best perceived distance or something is that like a very interesting key finding is, do you report anything about that so this is just my questions yeah great okay so let me answer first question uh so i think i, I mean retina scanning display been years actually like uh, especially in the helmet mounted displays in the fighter jets in like uh, like some decades ago and it wasn't so mainstream i think it's technically difficult to miniaturize it but these days they have this really tiny laser modules and then uh, especially like example is this company qd laser they 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 were actually laser companies and they were able to make such a small unit and i think their product also they've been really struggling getting some medical improvement and so therefore they really assure the safety level of the laser. Actually, that's the, that's the issue, by the way, if I mean, you can't make the display too bright <laughs> mm. because otherwise it exceeds the, the limit. Right. And the second, but it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So maybe you can easily, it's gonna be affordable soon. And for the second question, uh, actually, can't recall if there was any significant reason why the line is crossing here. I mean, I mean, it, it, this 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 curve is kind of still maintained compared to the OSD HMDs. So my I conjecture this is just uh, we. I think it's still I conjecture there are still some biases in in mm. in it that is not covered by the retinal scanning displays. Right. Is, yeah. it, is it meters, but, by the way? The real position axis is oh, yeah. meters or centimeters? Uh, or? No, centimeters. OK, centimeters. Yeah, the experiment, by maybe I can show you the picture. So here, the distance is like hand reach mm, because right. accommodation doesn't help if it's farther than a few meters. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help. So we only care about this kind of hand reach or relatively close range. And what user actually did is we we put 
a target object at certain depths, which is actually, you can slide towards the axis because the magnet is beneath this thing, you don't see it, but you can smoothly slide it towards this viewing axis. And then the hand is also being tracked by OptiTrack and you have some a ring device with OptiTrack marker, which you users cannot see because you have these white walls and the users basically point the finger until it matches with their observation of the AR 3D object rendered next to the, the, the physical object and so on. Yep. Ah, Wait, sorry, I right. mean, oh, you, yeah, you see the yeah. real object and then move the finger or mm -hmm. you see the AR object and then you also move the finger. Anyways. Got it. Great. All right. So I think that that should be um, all for this presentation for this seminar. So thank you once again to Yuta for sharing his work as well as everyone here um, sitting through this one hour talk to hear um, to hear for the seminar. Um, look, please do look forward to our next one, which will be about two weeks from now, and it'll be announced on the ECL Facebook page. So thank you once again to everyone. Have a great day. See you. Thank you, Pai. Bye. Yeah. Um, if you yeah. guys, if anybody wants to talk after this talk, I can stay a little bit longer here. I mean, if nobody has a next meeting. Sounds good. I, I think if I leave, um, you would still be here if I'm not mistaken. So feel free to continue the um, conversation. Sure. Yeah. All right. I mean, if Take everyone care. leaves, I also leave. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> or if there's any other questions that you want me to link with Utah, I'll be happy to do so as well. Right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.